Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome participants to this meeting of full council. The meeting is being live streamed to the council's YouTube channel and a recording of the meeting will remain online for six months. If you're making representation to the meeting, you are consenting to the use of those sound recordings for broadcasting and training purposes. For housekeeping purposes, a fire alarm test is not expected, so if the alarm does sound, please make your way to the nearest fire exit. I'd like to welcome any members of the public watching the meeting on YouTube, and I'd now like to politely remind members of our speaking limit, which is now three minutes in debate. So apologies, we have apologies from councillors Barnes, Bassett-Smith, Boys, Klukas, Hay, Oliver and Wilkinson. Is there any more? And Councillor Harvey may be late. Declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest to declare? No? Okay. Moving on to the minutes of the last meeting. We've got two minutes to approve. One from the 12th of December and one from the 9th of January. Does anybody have any um, objections or comments on either of those? So everybody's happy to sign? Okay. Thank you very much. Do we need to, sorry, do we need to approve those by? I'll just do it by show of Okay. Okay. Uh, to formally approve the minutes of both meetings, please raise your hands. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item four, communications by the Mayor. Firstly, I'd like to welcome our new councillor for Backledown, Ed Gidley. Ed succeeds Louis Savage, who, as we know, was mentioned in the January the 9th meeting, where he was thanked and wished well. So welcome to you, Ed. And I'm sure you'll all join me in asking the Deputy Leader, Councillor Jeffries, to pass on this Council's best wishes to the Leader, Councillor Rowena Hay, as she recovers from open heart surgery. We wish her a full and speedy recovery. If you could do that, thank you. No child left behind. I was delighted to be asked a while ago to shortlist some of the categories for the No Child Left Behind Awards. I have to say it was the hardest thing that I've ever done, because in my opinion, they were all winners. And this year, No Child Left Behind received its highest amount of entries with more than 60 submitted by organisations, teams and individuals across the 12 categories. On the 26th of January, both the Deputy Mayor and I had the pleasure of attending the third No Child Left Behind Awards at the Town Hall. I had the honour of presenting an award, and Matt presented a bouquet of flowers to the host in the Voice in the Sky. It was a great night, wasn't it, Matt? I remember their names as well. <laughs> <laughs> there were over 300 guests, including families and children, celebrating the achievements of Cheltenham's organisations who work towards long-term change, addressing inequalities and offering support. The award showcased all the fantastic work that's making a real difference to Cheltenham's children, young people and their families, facing challenges including family support, physical and mental health. Guests were also treated to exciting and inclusive mu music performances by Oakwood Primary School Samba Band and the Belmont School Choir. It was, as I said, a fantastic evening. It was emotional, it was humbling, and I think Matt and I were both honoured to be part of it. Finally, um, in case anybody is interested, my charity is hosting a, a quiz night on Friday the 31st of March at St Mark's and Hester's Way Community Centre. If anybody's interested, please see the details on the website. And that's me. So, moving on to communications by the Leader of the Council. Or Deputy Leader, sorry. I think Councillor Jeffers has requested some words be displayed on the screen behind, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, before I um, continue, yes, I, uh, following up on the, the Mayor's comments regarding Councillor Hay, clearly that's why I'm here in this role as Deputy. Um, sorry, I got distracted sorry. slightly. Um, yes, yeah, Serena is at home resting and recuperating. Um, possibly keep an eye on us today via YouTube, you never know. But our best wishes to Rowena, and we look forward to seeing her back here, due, in due, back here in due course. I will pass on that right now. And again, the battle down by election. Wow. The Liberal, the Liberal, Democrat, Liberal Democrats, first councillor representing battle down, so welcome, Councillor Tiddley. Um, I'll ask CSU to put that on the screen now, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> um, councillor Payne, as the chair of the Scrutiny Committee, has raised an urgent request. Uh, this was in discussion, actually, I think, just when the deadline for motions and questions had passed. So, in the spirit, given that this is the request, members, for yourself to see, um, given the, the topic and the seriousness and the urgentness, urgency of the request, I felt it right just to action the request in my role as standing leader. But I want to share with members the actual request from Councillor Payne. Clearly, our young people in dental surgery is of concern. So I will make that action in due course, but I just want to share with colleagues across this council and this chamber the action I am taking. I thought it was prudent. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Councillor Payne. Like I say, in your chair, in your role as chair of your scrutiny, you are privy to some documents, probably more so than uh, I get to read sometimes. Thank you. Um, I've just got one other topic of business I'd like to update council on, in that we were not successful in the living up bid. Some members may or may not have been astute to see that Cheltenham wasn't successful. Um, clearly, we believe that the National Cyber Innovation Centre is going to have huge and positive implications across the county. Not only for us in Cheltenham, but across the county. Um, I know that uh, we're keen to understand with the relevant government department as to why that bid wasn't successful. I know there are conversations that are going to take place. In fact, conversations are already underway. So I just wanted to update members. It doesn't clearly uh, weaken our resolve in delivering that project. So I just wanted to update members. That's what I have, Madam Mayor, at the moment. Thank you. Agenda item six, to receive petitions. I'm not aware that we have any. We have no public questions. So we'll move on to member questions. And we've got two. So, Councillor Harmon, you've got your response. Do you have a supplementary? Thank you. Question two is from Councillor Emma Nelson to the Cabinet Member for Finance and Assets, Councillor Pete Jeffries. Do you take the answer is read, Councillor Nelson, and do you have a supplementary? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nelson, for your question. Um, I don't honestly know, if I'm too fair. I don't, couldn't put a date on it. What I can tell you is weeks rather than months. Um, I know that the conversation is ongoing between our property team and the developer. So um, weeks, I'm told, rather than months. But as soon as I have a date, I will share that. Thank you. We now move on to agenda item nine which is the Corporate Plan 2023 to 2027. And I'd like to invite the Deputy Leader, Councillor Peter Jeffries, to in introduce the report on behalf of the Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I'm obviously bringing this report um, on behalf of Councillor Hay. Um, and this is a statement from Councillor Hay. But uh, so Councillor Hay would like to say that before uh, talking about the new Corporate Plan, it's important to take a moment to reflect on what has been achieved. And there is a lot to be proud of, such as uh, development agreement. It is on. Can you not hear me, colleagues? Yeah. My apologies. Maybe it's me waving my paper in front of the... My apologies, colleagues. Uh, yes, much to be proud of. The development agreement signed with HBD Factory to take forward the Golden Valley development which will help cement Cheltenham as cyber central capital of the UK. £40 million has been invested so far in, to increase the supply of affordable homes in partnership with Cheltenham Borough Homes. 
the creation of the Climate Emergency Action Plan pathway to net zero, including the creation and approval of the Climate Change Supplementary Planning Document to raise standards for sustainable housing development. £1.1 million of external funding secured from the Shared Prosperity Fund to support carbon busting initiatives, skill boosting schemes, supporting business growth and the new cycle hub. We've also launched the Cheltenham Lottery, which has raised over £100,000 for local good causes so far. New digital services have made it easier for residents and businesses to contact and transact with the Council. Also, the newly opened reception providing a drop-in or appointments for those residents that prefer to see someone in person. Our work has been nationally recognised where we have won Best Commercial Council, Punchline Gloucestershire's Community and Business Champion, Royal Town Planning Institute Award in the Planning Heroes in a Pandemic category, and that's a mouthful in itself, and Federation of Small Business Local Government Award for Best COVID-19 Support and Recovery for the South West Region. Overall, resident satisfaction with Cheltenham as a place to live is 90%, which is an increase of 6% compared to 2019 and well above the Local Government Association benchmark. This has been achieved despite a pandemic and the continued challenging financial position that this District Council and all District Councils continue to operate in. Now, as we look forward and ahead, there are huge opportunities for Cheltenham, but also some challenges. Our new corporate plan continues our ambition for Cheltenham, including <coughs> continuing to enhance Cheltenham's reputation as the site of the capital of the UK through the Golden Valley development. Progression of the Climate Emergency Action Plan, just mentioned that, pathway to net zero. This is in which has now seen Cheltenham Borough Council securing an investment to explore heat networks. Further increasing the supply of affordable carbon neutral homes through our £180 million housing investment plan, as well as retrofitting of existing homes. A renewed focus on culture, leisure, economic and community development to continue to ensure Cheltenham is a great place to live, work and explore. This will be underpinned by continuing to improve customer services and how the council works through new technology, as well as finding ways to increase income to continue to invest in frontline services. Thank you, members. I therefore have no hesitation in recommending the new corporate plan for approval. I'd like to thank many officers who have contributed to this report right across the council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. Before we go on to questions, we are going... I was going to say, before we move on to questions, we're going to watch a short four-minute video. Cheltenham Borough Council has a proud tradition of supporting residents, communities and businesses to help make Cheltenham a special place to live, work and explore. Our recent independent resident survey showed that overall satisfaction with Cheltenham as a place to live is 90%. We've worked hard to become an award-winning council, but we know we aren't immune to the pressures everyone is feeling and there are many things beyond our control. Our new corporate plan sets out how we will play our role to help to continue to make Cheltenham a place people can be proud of. Our corporate plan has five key priorities. Priority one, we will enhance Cheltenham's reputation as the cyber capital of the UK through the Golden Valley development, which will see the creation of the UK's National Cyber Innovation Centre, Cyber Business Park and 3,700 homes based on green principles. This will create jobs, homes, safeguard Cheltenham's future economic prosperity and contribute to the UK's goal to become a science superpower. Priority two, through our Climate Emergency Action Plan Pathway to Net Zero, we will work with residents, communities, businesses, public and voluntary organisations to play our role in working towards making Cheltenham net zero by 2030. This will include many initiatives such as continuing to improve recycling rates, champion sustainable development, our Green Deal will see investment to reduce energy consumption across council-owned buildings, and we will undertake a feasibility study for launching heat networks, which could warm hundreds of homes and businesses in the town. Priority three, local people want more affordable homes and through our £180 million housing investment plan, we will increase the supply of new affordable homes and will break new ground by making them energy efficient and carbon neutral too. We will continue investment in safe, 
protect, secure and energy efficient council owned housing and will work with Cheltenham Borough Homes to help reduce homelessness and rough sleeping. Priority four, we will ensure our residents, communities and businesses benefit from Cheltenham's future prosperity. This will involve building on Cheltenham's strong cultural, leisure and hospitality sectors, as well as developing a sports strategy to improve health and wellbeing opportunities. Through No Child Left Behind, we will continue to work with the public sector, businesses and charities to help support those most in need. In partnerships with schools, colleges and universities, we will help equip local people with the skills they need for jobs now and in the future. We will also support initiatives to regenerate the high street to increase footfall. Priority 5. These priorities will be underpinned by becoming a more modern, efficient and financially sustainable council. This will include new digital services that will make it easier for customers to access services they need, pay for bills and make applications at times suited to them. This will increase the time available to help those vulnerable customers who need more support from us. We've won national awards for our commercial investment strategy, which helps us support frontline services and to invest in Cheltenham. We will continue to do this while exploring ways to reduce costs and ensure value for money for the taxpayer. To find out more about our corporate plan, please visit our website or follow Cheltenham Borough Council on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. Thank you for that. We'll now, um, I'll invite any, any questions on the report. Councillor Harmon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, before I come on to just a couple of comments on this, I just want to say two things. Firstly, um, to agree with the comments, our best wishes to Councillor Rowena Hay, and I'll be contacting her directly on behalf of the group. I'm sure we look forward to seeing her um, here in robust health very soon. The other thing I wanted to mention um, is in this historic week, which will mark the anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we should also remember the late Chris Parry, who you know was a, a Cheltenham resident, I believe I've met him, he was very familiar, who together with another volunteer um, lost their lives in Ukraine recently doing really incredibly good uh, humanitarian work. So I just want to put that on record, I think we should say that as a council, I'm sure we'd all agree. Um, a couple of comments on this, I mean, it, yes, it's difficult to sort of disagree with it, but I'm always, whenever this comes up, it's great. An old boss of mine would have called it motherhood and apple pie, his word is not mine. What matters is delivery underneath, isn't it? The 90% you know, approval rate is good, but I mean, I, I, we can't just say that only Cheltenham Borough Council's delivered that because it's so much a part of the sort of cocktail of Cheltenham, isn't it? Um, the lifestyle we have, you know, the festivals that we have, um, the libraries we have, um, you know, the, the sort of general um, stake, stakeholders across the game, the health service, the doctors, etc. they all contribute to making Cheltenham a good place to live. So um, I don't think we can just say, all of it's Cheltenham Borough Council, but obviously we play an important part. Um, a couple of other things also occur to me. We're talking about the, you know, the, the uh, government benefit development, which is very good. I, am, I imagine my question is, are we confident that we can fund what we're aiming to do um, and that we have a robust plan for delivery? So um, happy to support the thing in principle, but I think our job as an opposition, not just this party, but for others, will be to question delivery and not just aspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harmon. Um, you're going to take questions at the end. I've got Councillor Nelson then, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a quick one. We, the 90% satisfaction, uh, high satisfaction is very good. How many residents in Cheltenham actually responded as the base of that 90%, please? Thank you. Councillor Jeffries. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, if I may, to um, uh, Councillor Harmon, yes, it's a robust plan. Um, the actual business case and the numbers will come forward in due course and given a lot of scrutiny because you should imagine, can we afford it? I mean, where the economy has gone in the last 12 months, you have to question and relook at those figures again. But um, clearly, something that's uh, being monitored and in due course, I'm sure obviously members across the council will get to see 
the relevant figures in that business case and so forth. Um, Councillor Nelson, I don't have them to hand, ironically. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, I can uh, ask an action be taken that the relevant numbers be sent to you, if that's okay. Um, I don't have them to hand. I know that um, I believe somebody's looking for them right now. My apologies. But um, yes, yeah, so the amount of residents uh, spoken to. Try, try, big giveaway. Uh, just to help with that answer, the, um, this was part of the resident satisfaction survey. So there's a public cabinet report on that that's got all the detail of the, um, the exact numbers of, of, of participants who responded. Um, and the sample size was such that it was gave a statistical level of confidence on the accuracy of the answers that were provided. But it's all detailed in the cabinet report. I'm, I'm just looking at the cabinet report now to get you the specific number of people that were um, that answered the, the satisfaction survey. If there are no more questions, then we'll move on to the debate. Are there any members who wish to speak to the item? And if so, you've got a maximum of three minutes. Councillor Horwood. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to, well, first of all, uh, thank Councillor Jeffries for bringing this corporate plan forward and for the sound financial management behind it, which makes it possible to address a wider range of issues. And without that sound financial management in this council, we wouldn't be able to address some of the other issues. But it is one of the others that I want to focus on, which is the environmental side. Um, and there is a chapter in the corporate plan um, which is headed, uh, what we will do to help make Cheltenham clean and green. And it's quite right that the headline issue is about climate change and moving to net zero, and that's quite right. It is probably the most serious um, environmental issue facing not just us in Cheltenham, but the whole planet. But there is another environmental crisis, which sometimes plays second fiddle to climate change, which I just want to talk about specifically, and that's biodiversity. Because that is, in many scientists' view, equally important. The, catastrophic species loss and loss of biodiversity uh, is leading many people in the environmental movement to talk not just about conservation anymore, in other words, trying to protect what's left after all the destruction that the human species has wrought on all the others, but actually to talk about nature recovery and trying to build biodiversity gain into everything we do. And I'm really proud that this corporate plan has measures in that chapter about biodiversity. It commits us to biodiversity net gain. It says we will work with local amenity and friends groups to enhance biodiversity in our public spaces, parks and gardens to further improve Cheltenham's environment. And most importantly of all, it says we will develop an ecology and biodiversity supplementary planning document to further support su sustainable development so that all the development we do in this town will deliver biodiversity net gain. And you can go and watch the David Attenborough TV shows, you can listen to Extinction Rebellion and watch them gluing themselves to things. But actually, and you can even, you know, if you're feeling really committed, you can watch the UN um, framework conventions that are developing on biodiversity as well as on climate change. But the truth is, what really makes a difference on biodiversity is decisions made on the ground, literally, in councils like this, in local communities. And when you think about where the UK stands in the biodiversity league table globally, we are in the bottom 10% for biodiversity loss. This is not just about the Brazilian rainforest. This is about the massive destruction of species and habitats that has gone on in this country since pre-industrial since pre times. We've lost half our biodiversity in this country. So it's a really serious issue in the UK. We are part of the problem and we need to be part of the solution. And I'm really, really proud proud that this corporate plan sets us, not with platitudes about motherhood and apple pie, actually, Councillor Harmon, but with practical steps to actually start on the path towards nature recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I remember the uh, resident survey coming to overview and scrutiny, so I very quickly have looked that up. And apparently, um, 1,346 people took part in the survey, which includes um, 1,100 who took part in the representative survey, and a further 246 who completed the open online survey consultation. Um, 
This compares, quite interestingly, to the 657 people who responded to a survey um, about the budget from the uh, Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. So Cheltenham got twice as many responses to a survey in just Cheltenham than the Police and Crime Commissioner did for the whole of Gloucestershire. Um, it's also interesting to note that one change um, that people were asked, uh, people commonly asked for, 28% um, of people, so just over a quarter of people, uh, wanted better maintenance of the roads and paths. Um, and as the survey says, it's important to recognise that highways is the responsibility of Gloucestershire, Count Gloucestershire County Council, not Cheltenham Borough Council, and we need to remember that Gloucestershire is run by a Conservative administration. Um, uh, a rather disappointing Conservative administration elsewhere in central government obviously chose not to invest in Cheltenham through the levelling up. And I think we need to ask what the, the government's commitment really is to this town to neglect um, not just Cheltenham but also such an important um, investment opportunity um, in the UK's national well-being and the, the national security of the UK. Um, not just an, a missed opportunity for them, um, but we're going to carry on regardless. The other thing I want to point out in terms of the commitment is the long-term and ongoing commitment of our officers to some of the delivery. And I don't have a huge amount of influence or oversight in this not being on Cabinet. But one thing I do see is the huge amount of work done by the licensing team in terms of the purple flag. We've got the best nighttime economy between the large conurbations of Bristol and Birmingham. We've got that purple flag. That does not happen by accident. That comes from a lot of hard work, mainly by the officers, but I'm glad to say that the members of this council, um, licensing committee, also have that opportunity to go out and see what the uh, officers are doing and to influence that. Um, and I think the cabinet member has also been out um, with the purple flag team. So this council does aim high, it does strive to deliver, members are involved and we will work hard. Um, we just need a government that will support and invest in the town um, as much as we want to. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Whitting. Um, um, Councillor Atherston. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Jeffries, for bringing this report to us today. I'd um, just like to say how important the, uh, the Cheltenham plan is because it actually does inform other strategies, including the housing revenue account and the housing revenue account business plan. And the five priorities, um, I just would like to say, <coughs> I've heard a, a resident mention that perhaps there was some confusion about them being order priorities. They're equally weighted priorities in terms of what we're going to be taking forward. Um, and one of those priorities is our continued commitment to our £180 million investment into affordable homes in Cheltenham. And just to point that so far, um, £43 million has already been spent over the past three and a half years um, to build 151 new affordable homes. And that the, there is an, an allocation uh, this coming uh, budget for 23-2024 for a further £22 million for an additional 76 homes. So, um, yeah, entirely the, the Cheltenham corporate plan has, is, is a very important document that has led to sort of giving structure to the way that we are going forward in developing new homes to Cheltenham residents that are affordable and also uh, the, those that are land-led schemes by Cheltenham Borough Council and Cheltenham Borough Homes are uh, net zero carbon or working towards net zero carbon. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dobie. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, my colleague, uh, Councillor Horwood, has referred already to a few of the clean and green improvements. And I'd like, as the Cabinet Member for Waste and Recycling and also for our Parks and Gardens, to highlight some of the uh, successes that we've had already, but also to look ahead to the future and to show that how ambition, um, ambitious we are as a Council in this area. We're looking to make improvements to reduce the amount of fuel that is used in our waste recycling, our parks and garden services, specifically so, through so-called in-cab technology, which will be quite revolutionary, so that 
people will be able to have a, a more responsive service, certainly for residents, but will, which will also lead to a greater degree of fuel efficiency and particularly with regard to carbon emissions. Uh, but already we have been at the national forefront in extending curbside recycling and I'd like to highlight just within the past year or so the uh, success we've had with the uh, podback scheme. We were the first in the country to introduce the possibility of collecting coffee pods uh, and recycling them in conjunction with a commercial organisation which was behind the production of those coffee pods. And so far we have recycled over two million of these and as a result we have also planted thousands of trees as well. And to me it's not surprising that we uh, were highlighted by 81% of residents being satisfied with the curbside recycling uh, service which is already provided in Cheltenham. And we're ambitious again for the future. Maybe, and I say certainly, may I say that now, we will be extending the service we're already providing of soft plastic uh, recycling. We're at the forefront of recycling. Already we are amongst the highest uh, level of recycling for any council in the, in the country. And looking at the what we've been doing on the parks and gardens, we have retained and indeed extended, it's not highlighted here, but we have extended the green flag status that's being achieved for Cheltenham's parks and gardens. And so it's probably not surprising that 88% of residents were satisfied with Cheltenham's parks and open spaces. And that's something that I'm very proud of as the, the relevant cabinet member. And that's something that we will only be building upon. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think we can um, all be really proud of this document and of this vision. Um, it's great that we are thinking ahead and not just for now. And the vision is challenging, but without question deliverable. And it is absolutely right, Councillor Harmon, that opposition groups challenge and ensure delivery. Equally right that members of this administration challenge and ensure delivery. But I would certainly like to congratulate the Cabinet and all the officers who have been involved in putting together this pretty impressive document and that pretty impressive video. Um, it was excellent. But to be a great town is more than just a vision and it's more than just a corporate document like this. And I think what we are really lucky about in our town is to have so many component parts which make it a great town. I talk about all the friends groups which give of their time to help in our parks and pick up litter. I talk about the civic society, which we don't always agree with, but takes a very proactive role in our town. The architects panel, which really makes a contribution in our planning debate. Um, football clubs, rugby clubs, all of those community clubs, the St. Peter's and the Saracens Club have just got a great scheme going forward. Lacampton has got a great scheme. So it's all these things which contribute to making this town great. But uh, the Borough Council has a big role to play in many of those things. Not necessarily leading, but certainly enabling and contributing. And we should be really proud of that. The negatives, frankly, are the national planning policy framework and the planning dictates we get from government, which are so outdated and so restrict what we as a planning committee can do. We've just had 350 homes be given permission by the government in the Greenbelt. How can we protect our A, O and B and our Greenbelt if we can't control our own planning decisions? It's shocking. And we really do need a modern planning framework to work with, which will enable us to throw out 350 new homes which have got gas boilers, which we probably can't at the moment, and we will probably lose that appeal. But we need real proper planning regimes that we can work to and deliver on. And finally, you know, we can't not mention the county council, can we? Because frankly, if you come into the town, you see the strand, it is a disgrace. And it's been a disgrace for years and years and years. And that's not this council's problem, it is the county council. Our roads are a disgrace. 
So we really need to get the County Council to pull its finger out and deliver for Cheltenham. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Any other member? No? Over to all oh, Councillor Joy. Thank you so much. So um, I actually um, I did want to say thank you to everyone who's um, put to, contributed towards this plan. Um, I did have a couple of um, questions that, well, things that I'd like to bring to the discussion, really, um, just in terms of the fact that um, noticing that the corporate plan is generally reviewed by overview and scrutiny, a panel that I myself am on. Um, I, I did want to extend appreciation for um, councillors who attended um, the meeting um, last Monday um, with Young Planet Cheltenham and Balcarra School students from Year 9 and Year 11 who came to, produ to pre um, present the findings that they had with um, the county-wide climate action survey. Um, they had around 70% completion rate with participating schools, which is a huge deal. Um, and the thing is that um, the people who actually were in attendance did actually say specifically they wanted more representation, they wanted more democratic engagement. And um, there are some mechanisms that I would really like Borough Council to consider. Um, the thing is we actually formally had a youth rep um, on the overview and scrutiny panel that actually would examine the um, corporate plan. Um, that around 2004 we had one and that's kind of been phased out. I'd really like to see that restored just so that we can actually have young people contributing to the corporate plan as well. I think that's really important because we don't tend to have a lot of youth retention in town. And this would be a really, really good way of encouraging people to actually feed in their views, just to try and like address, you know, kind of like our longer term approach, really. Um, I do know that there are other councils who go further as well in having youth democracy representation. Um, there are some councils who, for instance, have um, quarterly performance monitoring for every committee, and they have represented like, youth representations um, on those. Um, they have multiple um, youth reps on, let's say, for instance, a 2030 community engagement board. So the thing is that this should be stuff that with, is, with, is within our capacity to execute and to also put a, a certain amount of money towards funding. And I really think that it's important that we have that because um, it's really, really impossible to listen to young people, like li lit literally who haven't even finished school, some of them, and they don't see a future because they just kind of feel as though there's no opportunities for them, they're not going to be able to tackle it effectively, and actually democracy is a key part of helping them to feed in ideas and actually seeing what's feasible. I really, really want to see that happen, and that needs to be a part of corporate plans going, as going ahead. Um, I was also curious as to, in, with the resident survey, um, the fact they had a 90% um, satisfaction rate, um, we were actually seeing a high proportion of people with disabilities um, who were dissatisfied with Cheltenham, um, and that that had been an active change over the last few years, especially through the pandemic. So I would really like to see strategy in place to make sure that, I did raise this in overview and scrutiny, but I would really like to see a commitment to specific communities that are being left out and that are being left behind. Um, if we are in our number one um, key priority um, about executing the cyber park, I think it's really important to make sure that if we're working with lives of colour that we're funding them adequately and giving them the support they deserve. So that's kind of really what I wanted to bring to the table. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just got a few comments, really. Um, it's this corporate plan. It's a, it's a very well presented, I think, easy and easy to digest document. And there's loads of really good stuff in it. It's quite ambitious. Um, I really welcome the commitment uh, to the regeneration of housing estates. And uh, I mean, hopefully the, the Cheltenham West vision master plan can be dusted off and revisited uh, when it comes to that. Um, I also welcome the focus on the environment, uh, including the, the inclusion of developing the ecology and biodiversity planning document. I think that's, you know, that's great. Um, one thing that does uh, concern me, I guess, is that, that key priority one seems to be dependent on the success of the Golden Valley and central to that, uh, the Golden Valley development is the Innovation Centre. And it, I mean, it's my understanding that there's no um, funding plan in place for that. Um, there was a, the levelling up bid for 20 million, which we've heard um, we've not been successful in. And, um, and the, the sort of, it's my understanding that that whole thing pivots on that innovation centre. And we're also, as a council, we're already 
um, loans of 150 million with interest rates going up. So, I mean, it does really worry me um, that, that, that a lot of the priorities in the corporate plan are actually dependent on, on key priority one being successful and being successful fairly soon as well. Um, yeah, so it, it worries me a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member? No? Councillor Jeffries. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, colleagues, for those positive comments. Um, Biodiversity, Councillor Horwood, clearly a very clear priority for us and the future for young people. Um, I note some of the comments uh, from across the chamber, and I won't respond to all of them, only to say that this is a bold and future-thinking vision. Um, it is one that affects every resident in our town, which brings me to the actual point I do want to just touch on, which is Councillor Baker. And you're, you're so correct, Councillor Baker. This is why I got involved in politics, and I know that quite some of my colleagues got involved in politics, which is because of our communities. This corporate plan, plan reflects this, this administration's ambitions for our communities, with our communities. So you're, you are on the money as ever, Councillor Baker, so thank you for your comments. Um, I commend the report to you, Madam Mayor, on behalf of the Leader. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. We now go to the vote. If you would please use the electronic voting system. Moving on to um, agenda item 10, which is the housing revenue account revised forecast 2022 to 23 and budget 2023 to 2024. So I'd like to invite the cabinet member for finance and assets, Councillor Peter Jeffries, to introduce the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Colleagues, the cost of living crisis and the financial turbulence has had a major impact on our housing revenue accounts. Excessive cost inflation, increased interest, energy costs and additional compliance costs will increase overall expenditure in our housing revenue account by £2.5 million next year. Now, what, also what you'll be able to read in the report is whilst the budget proposal is for rents to increase, these are capped at seven cents across the board. I think the long-term impact of this high inflation and capped rent is substantial on our 30-year outlook, with capacity in the housing revenue account reducing by an estimated £79 million. This reduced capacity in the HRA means that the scale and pace of investment in our existing homes and our new homes needs to be carefully managed. Now, while it needs to be carefully managed through the 2023-24 budget proposals, in this report, it demonstrates our Council's commitment to our ambitious plans for delivering new homes, also improving the quality of our homes, but also protecting the services for tenants. Some points to note, £63 million over three years for additional affordable homes. £32 million of investment in improving our existing homes. £6 million specifically in energy improvement measures for the least efficient homes. Uh, colleagues, also in the report, and as one additional item which didn't go out with the consultation paperwork, I think it's right that I bring it to your attention, it's detailed at 5.5 in the report. This is where Charlton has been allocated £2.36 million from the government's local authority housing fund. This is for the provision of more affordable, home, more of affordable homes in support of our refugee guests, predominantly those from Ukraine and Afghanistan. The total cost in providing these homes is estimated to be, to be around £6 million. Now, the government has given us a list of criteria with which we have to work within, notably a condensed timescale. Um, but I know that officers from both Chamber Homes and Chamber Council are working on this as we speak. Now, the HRA budget proposals continues to focus on supporting tenants through this cost of living crisis. I know the Chamber Homes Benefit and Money Advice Team and the Chamber well, Homes Training and Employment Team, they're just two of the front lines of support for tenants. 
targeting those resources in a, in a proactive and preventative approach is really working for tenants in need. Also, the Help To initiative, which works with a range of partners and agencies, improving equally beneficial to those tenants. Funding for these services has been protected within the 2023-2024 budget, recognising the challenging period ahead for our tenants in our communities. Now, as I've mentioned, this budget continues to invest in our priorities in delivering net zero homes, and it continues with our ambitious investment in delivering more affordable homes. All of this investment will help improve outcomes for all our residents and communities. It will help reduce inequality and also support the economic recovery of Cheltenham through this challenging period. The cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, and the continuing housing crisis have put such a strain on all the teams within Cheltenham Homes. Their work in support of our tenants has been exemplary. I wish to put on record my thanks for all their efforts and continued hard work. It would also be a bit remiss of me uh, not to thank the executive leadership team and the Chamber Home Board. Their continued support for our communities, again, is exemplary. Members, Madam Mayor, I commend to you the Housing Revenue Account Budget Proposals for 2023-2024. I'll have to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. <coughs> questions, any member? Well... You've escaped lightly, Councillor Jeffries. <coughs> now we'll move on to the debate. Any member? Councillor Baker. Well, firstly, um, I want to count, uh, congratulate Chartner Borough Homes on the absolute transformation of our housing stock over the last 10, 20 years. I remember when I was first the councillor in the 1980s in St Paul's, Frankly, the, sh the stock was in a shocking state. Residents, tenants, complaints were at an unbelievable level. I remember Councillor Aldridge accused me of being a clipboard councillor at the time because I just, he would go up down the street and have a list of outstanding repairs that long. We're not in that ball game anymore. And Chantner Borough Homes are to be congratulated for what they provide for the tenants in our town. It is exemplary in my view. Um, also exemplary is the way that they have worked with um, refugees coming into our town. And as a trustee of Chantal Welcomes Refugees, I can know firsthand um, how proactive and positive their role has been uh, looking after, I think, over 40 or 50 uh, refugees, families, Syrian, Afghan, and other nationalities as well. What annoys me and you wouldn't run a business this way, is the way government, at a whim, says there's suddenly billions of pounds available. If you bid for it in the next two weeks, you can have some of it. And it happens at county council level. It happens at borough council level. It's not a way to run a country. You would not run a business that way, where you say suddenly to um, the firms within your group, oh, we've just got a million pounds here. If you bid for it quickly, um, you might get some of it, and that's what happens at the moment. And local authorities of all political persuasions up and down the country are bidding against each other for a tiny pot of money or even a large pot of money. The county council was unsuccessful in a bid for um, bus tr public transport. We have just heard we were unsuccessful in a bid for levelling up. But suddenly we've got this money now for um, the uh, Ukrainian, no, sorry, for Ukrainian and Afghan refugees. Now, you might think I would welcome that. What I don't welcome is a, why they decide it should only be for Afghan and Ukrainian refugees and why they think they're better placed than Cheltenham Borough Homes is to decide the best way of allocating money and building houses and for who. Because they're not. It's a SOP. There are lots of refugees from all different nationalities looking for homes and there are lots of people in our town, born in our town, looking for homes. We should be given the money and then we should decide how we spend that money and who is that available for. It's, it's a sh and it's a shocking waste of time for all those councillors who are bidding for this money and don't get it. All that officer time that's gone into the research for doing it, it's just ridiculous. And now our officers are under huge pressure to try and deliver this within a, really, a, a, tight, a tight time scale. It's not acceptable. It's not a good way to run the country. And the sooner this government is out, and we have a government which actually runs the government like a proper business, the better. That's it. 
Thank you, Councillor Baker. You overrun your three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let you off this time. Councillor Addiston. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you again, Councillor Jeffries, for bringing this report to us today. I um, just want to really echo uh, what you said in terms of the uh, difficulties we're facing as a country right now and being able to move forward with any of our ambitious plans and the fact that a huge thanks to um, CBC and CBH uh, senior finance officers for being able to balance the budget so that in 2023-2024 we are still in a position where we are continuing with our plans to build not just affordable new homes but uh, affordable carbon net zero homes. Um, I'd just like to highlight a couple of those uh, new build pro uh, projects. So 24 new uh, carbon net zero homes uh, on 320 Swindon Road coming forward this year. Uh, nine net zero carbon homes under Section 106 scheme with a local developer coming forward this year. And, uh, and then with a future pipeline of uh, in continuing to invest 69 million over the next three years into our affordable new homes with uh, ambitions for 70 new carbon net zero homes for existing HRA um, land-led schemes. Um, and this, you know, it's not just about new homes, as Peter mentioned, sorry, Councillor Jeffries mentioned, it's also about making sure that we continue to deliver these valuable service that our residents need, you know, whether that's claiming back money on their behalf for the benefit and, benefit and money advice um, team, um, supporting with repairs, and maintenance, um, working with the community investment teams. You know, these, this is all, these are really, really valuable services that thanks to the HRA, we were able to support. So thank you to all the officers at Chatham Borough Homes and Chatham Borough Councils for um, being able to put us into a position where we can deliver this for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Atherstone. Councillor Willingham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to add my thanks to um, CBH for the work that they do um, in the more deprived areas of Cheltenham, um, which includes um, part of St Mark's, which I represent as a county councillor, which happens to be the most deprived area in Cheltenham and one of the 12 areas in the whole of Gloucestershire that's in the 10% most deprived in the English um, indices of deprivation. And I know that Cheltenham Borough Homes have worked really hard um, to try and find ways of actually tackling that. And there's no quick fix. Um, but I think um, what will hopefully be of interest to yourself, Madam Mayor, and also to um, your ward colleague, Councillor Pinnegra, is I'm hopeful there will be some good news about that in due course. Um, and I really just want to put on record my thanks to CBH for the bid that they put in which I was able to support, and um, I'm hoping it will be successful. Um, uh, but more news, more news on that in due course, I guess. Um, but it just shows the work that they do and the speed they have to turn things round, um, and the work they do for the community that people probably don't see. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> Members will know I have been a long time supporter of Cheltenham Borough Homes. I think we are extremely fortunate in this town to have an organisation like Cheltenham Borough Homes. Not only do they provide good quality homes, but they also provide, they have a social conscience and they really look after their residents, which I think is really important, particularly now where we constantly hear about mental health issues, well-being issues. I am convinced there are no better um, um, tenants in the country being served by Cheltenham Borough Homes. When I read the HRA report, I was horrified that the the impact that cost of living has had, the rising cost of fuel, supplies, the supply chain, um, the capping of rents, all working against their ambition. And they are an ambitious organisation, make no bones about it. But 
I am reassured that the team they have at Cheltenham Borough Homes is a very competent, imaginative and hard-working team. And they will see us through this crisis. I have no doubt about it. And I would like to join my colleagues in thanking the team at Cheltenham Borough Homes for the excellent work they do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Any other member? No? So we'll move to you then, Councillor Jeffries, if you've got anything to add. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I did have some specific examples of how Chamber Homes interact with tenants and residents. Um, some really harrowing cases to share with members. But I just think, actually, I think members get Chamber Homes. They get that they work within our communities for our communities. So I'm not going to add those to this, uh, this conversation. Uh, but just thank colleagues from across the chamber for their, their positive remarks. Uh, Councillor Baker, on the specific point you, re you referenced, government, I too am disappointed. Um, whilst it's welcome to have funds, and we did have that funds allocated for our, our ref refugee guests, the tight timescale is unbelievable in property terms. So it does put undue pressure, undoubtedly. So I echo your comments and disappointment in our where the government um, handles their, their finances and how they treat us. So, um, but on that, on a more positive note, Chamber Homes always aim for perfection, and we settle for outstanding. So, thank you, Madam Mayor. Commend the report to you. So that's unanimous for those members that are in the room. So we'll move on now then, <coughs> excuse me, to agenda item 11, which is the general fund revenue and capital final budget proposals 2023 to 2024. And I'd like to propose the suspension of the following rules of debate. That the time limit on speeches is relaxed with regard to the following speeches which is the Cabinet Member Finance when moving the motion to adopt the budget being proposed by the Cabinet. Turning over the page. Group leaders when making a budget statement on behalf of the group. To permit the Cabinet Member Finance and Assets and group leaders to speak more than once in the debate for the purposes of putting and answering questions. So I'm going to go over then to um, the Cabinet Member Finance and Assets, Councillor Peter Jeffries, to take the floor again for his introduction. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have the pleasure in presenting to you this afternoon the final General Fund Revenue and Capital Budget Proposals for the financial year 2023-2024. Uh, before we go any further, I wanted to reflect on some of the economic changes over the last 12 months which provide the background for setting this budget. When I stood here last February, inflation was at a 40-year high of 5.1%. That's last February. When the draft budget was released for consultation, it sat at 11.1%. These are levels not seen in many of our lifetimes. Interest rates have increased eight times, eight times since this same budget paper was presented last year, from a base rate of 0.5% in February 2022 to 4% just last week. Also in February 2022, we paid about 15p for a unit of electricity and 3p for a unit of gas. This is now 40p and 10p respectively. And that is the price with government caps on pricing. And let's not forget, members, we've also had three prime ministers and four chancellors. It's been a busy year. This government's economic policy over the last 12 months has seen more twists and turns than something akin to a clown on a unicycle. <laughs> personally, oh. personally, I'm still a little lost for words as to how any government, when our national economy is under so much strain, can inflict such an act of economic self-harm on the people it's supposed to protect, 
Trashonomics and the economic fallout has been a catastrophe, costing somewhere between 50 and 70 billion pounds, depending on which you know, economic analysis you read. To one degree or another, everybody in the country is paying the price for this continued Conservative government's fiscal failure. I mean, I have heard this Conservative government referred to over the same period as a bit of a circus. The last 12 months in financial terms has been unpredictable and volatile. The financial turbulence that we've had and are experiencing will go down in history. This is the background and some of the contexts in which we have been operating in. Now, as a direct result of these extreme economic times, we will have to take decisive action to ensure our resources are balanced to deliver on our commitments, particularly considering the economic challenges which are forecast to continue into the medium term. I mean, the final local government financial settlement, which sets out our levels of government funding for 2023-2024, includes only a 3% increase in our core funding and gives certainty for this funding for one year only. We've had to deal with a single-year settlement since 2019, and no long-term guarantee of funding is expected until the fair funding review, which has again been delayed until 2025-2026. After 12 years of austerity, this is a bitter pill to swallow, after the pressures which were managed through the pandemic and the economic impact of the government's mini-budget in November. With the latest budget monitoring report for 2022-2023 reporting a £2.39 million overspend against what was a reasonable and prudent budget this time last year, we are placing reliance on our general balances to balance the budget this year. However, these balances are finite, and this is not a long-term strategy we can rely on. This now places greater reliance on local tax generation and our own commerciality to enable us to balance the budget for 2023-2024. Excuse me, colleagues. Oh. In order for us to meet our financial commitments with the uncertainty of future funding, but with responsibilities to deliver services while maintaining robust reserves, we still have a challenging savings strategy to deliver. Some of you may wonder if you're experiencing deja vu. This is a message we seem to give year after year, as spending pressures continue to outstrip the funding received from government. Our challenge has been to continue to drive forward with the goals outlined in our COVID-19 recovery strategy and in our new corporate plan that's just been agreed at the start of this meeting. These priorities are to continue with our aim of making Cheltenham the cyber capital of the UK, to invest in the sustainable economic growth of the town, to continue to support our most vulnerable communities through No Child Left Behind initiatives. To continue our £180 million affordable housing programme, delivering more homes across our town. To continue with our commitment to make our council and our town net zero by 2030. Now, one specific item I would like to draw your attention to in the budget papers that we can look forward to is the coronation of King Charles III. And we want our communities to be able to commemorate this occasion so we'll be relaunching our existing Community Pride Grant as the King Charles Coronation Grant, centred on some of the King's known values, such as inclusion, young people, biodiversity and the environment. We hope in the same way as the Platinum Jubilee Grant Fund last year, this will provide opportunities for our communities to come together and celebrate as we look to the future. The budget presented for approval today reaffirms this administration's commitment to the delivery of our corporate plan, in spite of the extraordinary economic environment we are operating in. There's so much about Cheltenham that makes me optimistic. The people, the ambition, the skills and our communities. They make me so proud and again the coming together of everyone's efforts over the last 12 months has demonstrated this. Now at this point I'd like to put on record my thanks to the Council's finance team who continue to amaze me in how they work through these ongoing financial challenges. Equally my thanks to all Council officers that have been involved in bringing this budget together. Now, I'm happy to take any questions, and as we've become accustomed, relevant Cabinet members will answer questions around their own portfolios if needed. I therefore move the recommendations as laid out for the General Fund Revenue and Capital Budget Proposals for the financial year 2023-2024. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. Do you have someone to formally second? Councillor Lewis, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Are you going to reserve your rights? Okay. Right. I now invite questions on the report. Um, any member? 
Councillor Baker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's just a, a question on Appendix 11, which talks about fees and charges. And, and this is an incredibly lengthy document, but also incredibly transparent. Uh, we can literally go through every single area of the Council's um, services and see what we're charging, and it's great. Uh, and it's clear that this year there hasn't been a an approach of it's just going to be 10% on everything or 12% on everything or whatever. Each area has been looked at on its merits to decide what can be acceptable, what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. Just the question for me, I think I know the answer. Um, but for me, planning fees are well understated. They have not been increased for four years. But the reason is it's set by government, so we have no control over that. And that's a shame, because that is an area that needs to be looked at. But also, I think, um, I think I'm right in saying, um, Councillor Jeffries, that uh, fees to do with licensing, gaming, and that sort of thing are also set by government. So it's not within the remit of this authority to increase those fees. But if you could just confirm for me. Councillor Jeffries, do you want to respond to questions as we go along? I thought you might. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Baker, you're quite correct. We've been trying to be extremely transparent, but unfortunately, we may have lost some of the clarity along that way. Um, yes, I believe the, the licensing enforcement uh, are setting statute, the majority of them are setting statute through the Gambling Act. And as you rightly say, the town and country planning regulations restrict what we can and can't set. So some of the ambiguity you may see, colleague members, on that spreadsheet where you see a zero, which is clear there are other mechanisms to go by. We have tried <coughs> to take a different approach. Um, please, some of the... Uh, fees and charges that we, we apply do affect our communities. And one of them to note in there is allotment fees. Where we want to encourage people to use allotments, we try to keep those to a minimum, just over 4%. So um, I hope that gives you the clarity, Councillor Baker, you were seeking, in that, um, yes, it's not as straightforward as the spreadsheet makes out. There's obviously other national legislation and also consultation processes we have to go through. Thank you. Councillor Nelson. Looking at Appendix 6, I think it's a fantastic budget, and I appreciate, on, as, as others have said, how much work has gone in by the officers, so I think it's a brilliant job you've done in very hard times. But this is on Appendix 6, right at the bottom, vehicles and recycling equipment, and I think I do may know the answer, it's all about accruals, but we've got a budget for 22-23 of 1.7 million, but the actual spend only 500,000, but the forecast outturn again is 1.7 million, so that's telling me... We're going to have nearly a million, well, over a million pounds worth of uh, replacement vehicles coming in in the next months. If we're going to spend it by the end of the year, it may be a detailed question. I'm sorry, it's just something that sort of leapt off the page at me. Last line, Appendix 6. Thank you. Uh, from my understanding, these uh, figures... Uh, provide to us from Utico, and there's a rolling programme of uh, vehicle replacements. So that's why the figure's rolling, um, if that makes sense to, or in, the, in relation to the point you've raised. I can't give any more detail on that, but if you want to see any more detail, I'm happy to provide it in due course. But uh, yeah, a rolling programme of vehicle replacement. Councillor uh, Nelson. Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Um, I noted that um, the, all the different uh, fees relating to the cemetery had been raised by 10%. Um, I just wondered what the justification was for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Let's start in point four, fees and charges at 10% across the board. And then there's obviously looking at that. And there have been conversations within each service department with service managers to see whether that's relevant or not. I can only say that uh, that conversation would have taken place within, internally within... within um, the directorates with the officers. So, uh, yes, inflation. Big, of course, one of the biggest uh, costs when it comes to the uh, cemetery crematory is fuel, unfortunately. It's been a massive, massive cost. So, um, unfortunately, a, there is a inflationary increase shown in the schedule there. Any other member? <clears throat> no? Sorry, yeah. Oh, OK. Councillor Seeker. I th if my memory serves me right, when we um, set up the Chelton Trust, it was going to be financially independent of this council, but there is a, an input of a, a million pounds 
for future development for the Cheltenham Trust, if you find that on page 167. Um, and um, I wondered what the um, sort of raison d'etre was behind that, um, if they're meant to be independent. Can I just double check which figure you're really looking at, Mr. Uh, Councillor Seacombe? It's under place and communities, and it says commercialisation opportunities within the Cheltenham Trust, and it says um, invest a sum of £1 million to pump prime the commercial opportunities identified by the Trust. Does that help you? Thanks, Councillor Seacombe, for that clarity. Yeah, this is a sum I think we, uh, we allocated a couple of years ago, and that's to pump prime that investment for commerciality to support the trust. So the trust will use that funding, or we, uh, and the trust will use that funding to enable that investor say sort of projects. That's my understanding of that figure, Councillor Seacombe. Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Sorry, I had a, a, another question on the cemetery fees. Um, I understand that the, the, um, the cost of the service to Cheltenham Borough Council is £1.5 million, yet the income that will be raised um, from, from those, those fees is £2.7 million, and that gives a, a, a net surplus of £1.2 million. So I wondered where that £1.2 million goes. Thank you. I'm going to have to refer it back to after the meeting and find you an answer for that, uh, Councillor Finn, if that's okay. A bit more of a detailed question I can provide over the meeting like this, if, that, is that, if that's agreeable. Thank you. Any member? No? Okay, so I think we now go to questions to the Section 151 officer on Section 25 report on Appendix 2. Nobody? Okay. We'll move on then to the statement by group leaders. So I'd like to invite Councillor Harmon for his statement on behalf of the Conservative group to include tabling but not moving any proposed amendment to the Council's, to the Cabinet's budget. And there's no time limit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, a few bits and pieces. Councillor Jeffries is having a very busy afternoon, by the way. I hope they've got something strong in that uh, glass over there. I would say, incidentally, before I come on to just mention our, our amendments, of which I have given notice, um, I would say that um, we all recognise in the last 12 months the world has changed dramatically since the invasion. And the weaponisation by the Kremlin of energy is what's happened. Um, and certainly the challenges for all individuals, organisations, councils, governments is considerable because of that um, unwarranted, unnecessary invasion which has cost thousands of lives and has also cost people a lot of money. And you know, other countries have also experienced similar problems, we're afraid. We can't say it's just here. Um, what I'd like to do, if I can also, is to thank the offices for the support that we get in preparing this complicated document and also I would also record my thanks to John Borough Holmes from the Unit Item. Um, now we have, I think we might have something to put on the screen, which is a, a summary of what we've said. Um, I can do it without that anyway, but... Um, okay, right, that's fine. There we go. So we, we've had this before. Now, I'm not sure, again, that I think that the... Um, um, the, uh, the sort of milk of human kindness will run to you agreeing to all our suggestions, but we, we put them forward sensibly. One of the problems we've had uh, has been very much, I think, that it'd be a necessary decision, in my view, to reduce the opening hours of the Swindon Road um, Recycling Centre, and only saving, according to the figures, 35 grand, which seems to us to be unnecessary. And I, I also think it's quite wrong that you haven't um, run the thing as a trial to see what the impact of that is, because I'm sure people will be turning up it's a very busy centre. I'll probably be down there myself at some point this week, obviously when it's open. So we wanted to find some way that we could save some money uh, to actually stand up and say, you know, we think that recycling is important 
and I don't think the excuse that other councils do it th this way is a reason because you can make your own decisions and I think it's a very, very valued service. From the reaction I've had, I had a let letter in the, um, the local echo, I've had lots of people contact me um, from different uh, political um, you know, points of view and attend to agree that they are concerned. That, that's our, an objective we'd like to get from this budget is to reach all those hours. We think the size of cabinet, you increased it by two years not long ago. We think it's too big. I think the functions of a district council could be um, easily covered by two or less cabinet members. And, you know, you can draw all kinds of comparisons if you like, but um, we think that's easily done and it's something that will not affect frontline service and enable us to make decisions like keeping the tip open. Um, now, we've also put at the bottom of that moving to four yearly elections. Now, again, this is where we probably, we probably won't support this, but we put it in once again because we will have in next year um, whole council elections because of the boundary changes, as I understand it, as things stand. Um, we are currently the only district council in Gloucestershire that does elections by instalments. Um, the county council is four years, all the other councils are four years, Coxwell District Council run by the Liberal Democrats is four years. So we think this is an opportunity to, once you've had those elections next um, May of next year, is to keep that and you've got a re an election reserve and I'm advised by the officers that you can use that to um, you know, save some money but also give people, I think, the, the true option of changing the counts if they want to, you know, confirming the winning case. But at the moment it's quite difficult to do because only half the elections are up. And the, the general public are, I think, totally confused about the way we do elections here. And they'll be even more confused when Springbank goes to a different parliamentary constituency. And, you know, I found when it was the elections in May of last year, people said to me, am I retiring because you weren't on the ballot paper? I had to explain to people that, you know, there, this is the reason, but um, I'm not retiring just yet. Um, so that's what we've said. Now, also, uh, Councillor Jeffries has, has picked up, I think, the suggestion we were making of, if you like, continuing the Jubilee Grant scheme to mark the coronation. I understand that scheme was a success. We did, mention, we did raise it at this stage of the budget meeting last year. So if he's doing it, that's good. I'd like to hear from a bit more detail. And I think it would also be a good idea if the um, terms of reference were perhaps agreed and discussed by the group leaders. I'm sure you would agree, because I think we have some good stuff there. Martin mentioned biodiversity earlier on, and we would like to see that in that grant scheme. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stand up with grant schemes a bit in Councillor Baker's comment because I think this is a good way of involving communities in, in coming up with ideas. And if you consider the, the amount of money that we've done, I think, each year with uh, the um, Community Pride and also um, what we've done with County Council's grants such as the Door Back Better, you'll see that they do make a real impact. So um, that is the Conservative Group proposals. Um, I'm not holding my breath as to whether you'll accept them, but we are in opposition. We are entitled to put forward ideas. But I would say to you that um, we've obviously run the, the figures past the, um, the uh, Section 151 officer, and I'm grateful to Paul and Gemma Bell for their um, responses. And I will therefore now uh, table that and sit down. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Harmon. So I'd now like to invite Councillor Payne for his statement on behalf of the PAB to include tabling but not moving any proposed amendment to the Cabinet's budget. And again, your time to roam. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> um, members, um, to set minds at rest, uh, I am pleased to confirm to the Council that the PAB group will not be putting forward any amendments, but that we should not be taken, uh, that should not be taken um, as meaning we do not have reservations. Before that, however, it is traditional that group leaders thank the officers for the production of the budget, something I am more than happy to do. However, I would, in addition to the officers, I would like to extend my thanks to the Cabinet and to the officers of CBH. The production of the budget, as members will appreciate, is a balancing act between the political ambitions of the Cabinet and the availability of resources. I take the view that the Council is very fortunate that we have a Cabinet and Finance team that has over previous years balanced investment, protection of key services and the creation of reserves. Reserves that have come to rescue in what has been 
a financially turbulent year. Whilst the PAB group is not suggesting changes to the current budget, it would wish to take the opportunity to raise a number of issues that it believes have potentially important financial implications for the future. The group has three concerns. The Golden Valley. Quite rightly, the Golden Valley is described as the number one priority and a vehicle that would deliver the Council's much sought after financial sustainability. But this is a long term ambition. Developments of this size can deliver significant returns but are associated with significant risks. Risks that as a consequence of the partnership are not entirely within CBC's control. It is for this reason that the ONS committee requested that the CBC project team report progress and particularly emerging risks to ONS Council, ONS and the Council on a regular basis. To mitigate this risk, PAB would encourage CBC to continue with its diverse, diverse investment programme. Uh, climate change. Cheltenham Borough was one of the first councils to declare a climate emergency and to publish um, a climate change special planning document and now has a climate emergency team in place. What it does not have is the resources needed to fully support the ambitions of Cheltenham to be carbon neutral by 2030. Government funding is absolutely critical. To give an indication of costs, CBH um, has submitted a bid for £2.2 million towards the £6 million needed to retrofit 200 houses. CBH has 4,000 houses. And finally, um, deprivation. Priority four, ensuring residents, communities and businesses benefit from our future growth. This is PAB's view is critical to the success of Cheltenham and was clearly articulated in CBC's place strategy where all people and communities they live in thrive. As the recent ONS task group on deprivation will demonstrate, we as, we as a town are some considerable way from that ambition. And whilst many of the aspects that contribute to the deprivation are outside the remit of this council, many are within its influence. And I am concerned that the lack of resource may prevent effective intervention. The PAB group would therefore urge the council to provide the resources to the allocation in forthcoming budgets to address this issue. And finally, Madam Mayor, despite the aforementioned concerns, the PAB group will be supporting what it sees as a well-balanced budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Payne. I'd now like to invite Councillor Joy for the statements on behalf of the Green Group to include tabling but not moving, any proposed amendment to the Cabinet's budget, and again, there's no time limit. Thank you so much. Um, so in, in some ways, um, this is an exciting time for me because this is actually the first budget that the Green Group has actually put forward. So um, we, we kind of participated in the budget consultation, but we weren't really able to put together a very strategic and inclusive um, proposal. Um, in some ways, like, um, we, we did raise some concerns. Um, we're, we're learning a lot of lessons for next year, I think, or for next time around. 
Um, I think that this has given us a really good opportunity to kind of really get to grips with the way budgetary processes work. And um, in some ways, like my, myself being elected just last year, it was quite a good opportunity to actually kind of look at things from the ground up and kind of try to reimagine things a little bit. Um, there are lots of sort of routine processes that I don't, I'm not in a position to take for granted because I'm so new to all of this. So I, I have to ask why it happens as it does. And um, I definitely would like to see more integrated and kind of holistic approaches to the costs that we find ourselves having to face. Um, it's frustrating to have to deal with things for, you know, that are unpredictable situations that um, we, we can't foresee. And, um, and actually just the fact that we, do, we don't necessarily have a very flat hierarchical structure in terms of devolved policy. Um, the fact that we have to have many, many statutory rates you know, for planning, you know, for gambling, like just licensing, just as I think um, Councillor Baker said. You know, the fact that we are limited in what we have to do, and yet we are constantly kind of carrying the can for a lot of seemingly arbitrary um, fees and standards. It kind of makes it a bit onerous to unpick the things that are within our sphere of influence. And um, I would really like to, the, the Green Group in general, would like to call for, um, you know, like a general changing the way C Cheltenham Borough Council actually interacts with national government, with corporations. We, we dispose of people's waste, but why are we not asking the producers of waste why they generate so much? Can't we turn off the tap of plastic waste instead of having to find places to put it? Um, I would kind of, the thing, the thing is that because responsibility does lie with us to take care of these things, you know, it, it's customer service, you know, we're, we're the customer facing agents. And um, we have to try and explain the processes that nece aren't necessarily, you know, something that we can justify. Um, and that does put quite a lot of pressure on local councillors, on local councils in general. Um, and I kind of would like to see a little bit more of a discussion about ways we can actually proactively prevent problems, um, you know, in terms of national policy. Feels like a big ask. Um, and I don't know how much resource we actually have to do it, but I think we have to. Um, there's so much that is outside of our control that we need to take ownership over. And, you know, it kind of results in things like cemetery fees increasing by 10%. That reflects inflation. But, you know, it, can, it kind of means that we end up subsidising sort of planning fees, you know, with, with our services that actually people can't avoid paying for, you know, tends to subsidise things that people have some choice over. So I think a lot of this ends up doing this sociological commentary, but it's ecosystems, it all feeds into each other. I think that this is something that we need to be mindful of. I, we did put forward some suggested amendments, but in some ways I don't want to put people on the spot and ask them to approve them because, you know, as, as I said, we couldn't really give a blow by blow. Um, we couldn't actually address everything on the, the agenda. So I personally am really thankful for the opportunity to feed in. Um, I'm <coughs> excited for the next time I get to do this. Um, and I'm hopeful that actually we'll keep checking in on this and keep reevaluating our stance because, you know, the last few years have definitely shown us how much changes and just trying to bring in as much responsibility is, is you know, the thing is that ultimately we get frustrated when we can't solve problems and I, feel like a lot of people here would like to be empowered to solve them as much as they can. So I think that that's um, pretty much what I wanted to say. And um, I'm, the Green Group on the whole is quite pleased to see a budget being put forward that tries to address as many of these precarious changes and strange thing times as they can. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Joy. So, Councillor Harmon, would you now like to formally move your amendments and do you have a seconder? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I'm, I will formally move our amendments and I believe Councillor Fifield is prepared to second. Thank you. Now, Councillor Jeffries, um, are you going to accept the amendment or would you like to adjourn to discuss it? Sorry? They want an adjournment. Yeah, they're for an adjournment. An adjournment. Okay. So if we meet back here in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So back back in for quarter past. Thank you.
Councillor Jeffreys, do you have an update? Thank you, Madam Mayor. It may come as no shock to some colleagues that I do not propose to accept this amendment. Right. Oh. Okay, I'm just trying to find my notes now. So, um, you formally moved the amendments and you've got a seconder. Um, do you want to speak now, Councillor Fifield, or are you going to reserve your rights? Okay, so we now move on to the debate on the amendment. On the amendment. Any member? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I can't see you over the Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to say a few words about the proposal to uh, amend our amended times. Centre. Now, we recognise the importance of the HRC to the people of Cheltenham, and indeed we go the extra mile to provide it. The CBC Household Recycling Centre is a discretionary service. We're the only district council in the country to provide the service, I believe. But if we are to continue to provide this discretionary service, let's not forget, in the face of continuing year-on-year -year cuts from this Conservative government to local authority funding, and it's necessary to look at rationalising its opening hours, especially as, and we've done the analysis, since the COVID pandemic, new patterns of usage have emerged. And we also need to look at opening times in order to minimise energy use in line with our policy. So we did not take this decision lightly, and I think you should recognise that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Collins. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> this won't come as a surprise, I'm, I'm sure, but which two Cabinet positions would you like to get rid of then? I mean, one of the two new ones that was specifically created to closely manage and support the Golden Valley development just a few years ago. And the reason for that was to reinforce just how important that position is to this council and to Gloucestershire and even the nation as a whole. I'll just tell you something. The Golden Valley Development and Charlton Borough Council have just been shortlisted by the LGC Awards 2023 in their economic support category. So if others can recognise how important the cabinet role is for this particular portfolio, why can't you? Thank you. Councillor Atherstone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just like to say that I think this is definitely the second, if not third time, that this has come round. Um, and I remember having the conversation about the two cabinet members last <coughs> year, and but also with regards to the uh, the election, local election cycle. And I just want to sort of explain the importance that I believe for residents of across all of Cheltenham that we have some level of continuity and actually I know that when I stepped into the role in St Peter's knowing that I had whether it was from the Liberal Democrat Party or whether it was from um, from the Conservatives or the Green Party that actually there was somebody that was there that was in a con you know had the experience and being a, a councillor is not just stepping into any role. There are multiple areas of responsibilities and in able to really, really support our residents, I think it's great to have that continuity and to be able to pass over and share without being thrown into a, a situation where no, every, both councillors have to start from scratch. So uh, I think for that alone, um, it, that certainly has my support and it would be the same in any business. You wouldn't just create a new team from scratch if you didn't have to. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Willingham. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's not just a case of deja vu, it's a case of deja vu again. Um, but if the Conservatives are going to uh, uh, embrace recycling with uh, the uh, budget amendments, then we can uh, at least uh, reciprocate with uh, recycling the jokes from uh, last year and the last year and the year before that. Um, I just wanted to uh, um, remind the Conservatives of 
the Conservative authorities around the UK who are quite happy with elections by halves, which include Adur, um, Fareham and Gosport, and I believe Nuneaton and Bedworth, um, but also the district councils that are quite happy with elections by thirds. Um, so Basildon, um, Brentwood, Broxbourne, Cannock Chase, Castle Point, Sherwell, um, Epping Forest. I could go on, I won't. Um, there is a long list of local authorities that are happy to elect by halves and elect by thirds. And in fact, as my colleague Councillor Atherston has said, this gives continuity, but it also means that there is the opportunity for the public to show their displeasure uh, um, with more democracy, not less. And certainly in local government, more democracy seems good. Um, I'll stop there as we, we uh, I don't think, are going to accept the, the amendment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Hallward. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to address the, um, the reference in the Conservative Amendment to biodiversity and spending public money on, on biodiversity, which sounds, on the surface, like a good thing. Except, of course, this is a cost-neutral set of amendments, as I understand it. So this is diverting money from somewhere else uh, in order to spend on this. Now, actually, the Conservative group very kindly uh, supported our corporate plan, which includes the steps on biodiversity, which I've already mentioned, and which we're confident we can deliver within the existing budget. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the corporate plan. And actually, the most important ones are not about finding pots of money from other services to divert into this. They are about changing policy. And the crucial one there is the supplementary planning document and the delivery of biodiversity net gain in planning, where actually, if you imagine, every planning development that comes forward delivers biodiversity net gain at the cost of the developers or the people taking, bringing forward those developments, that's massively more important to biodiversity than trying to take money away from another public service to spend on a pot of money, as is suggested in this amendment. So I just think... Although I understand the, the good intentions behind it, I think in practice this is not the most important way to deliver biodiversity and it's not a practical way uh, to, to bring it forward. So, uh, like my colleagues, I'm certainly voting against this amendment. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and congratulations, uh, Councillor Harmon, on having the thick skin to present uh, a really original set of amendments. Um, we can rehearse the same arguments we've had over the last how many years. I think, you know, for me, um, accountability as a councillor is really, really important. And two yearly elections give the electorate the chance to speak uh, and, and give their opinion on the performance of their local councillor and indeed their council. And rather than having to wait every four years to do that. And I think in the main, a lot of people, a lot of electorates, the 35 or 40% who might turn out in some parts of our town, really appreciate the opportunity to give feedback uh, upon that performance, good or bad. Um, so for me, I would resist going to four yearly because I think accountability as an elected representative is critical. Um, I'd also compare and contrast the approach um, the Conservative group locally have to the approach of the county group. You know, to be presenting a set of amendments on the day of the budget meeting without any engagement with the controlling party is a nonsense. Um, at County Council, they have a constructive uh, engagement with opposition groups, and the opposition groups are obliged to submit their amendments in advance so they can be discussed and costed and often taken on board. Uh, here, we don't have that, and I would like in future budget meetings um, proposals to be changed so that they have to be submitted in advance so they can be properly discussed and engaged. And who knows, you might then actually find some of them being taken on board. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll just um, make a couple of comments, if I may. I'm not totally surprised that you all went off to your room and came back and did exactly the same as you did last year. But let me give you a couple of things to think about. And thank you, Councillor Baker. Yes, I have got a thick skin, thank you. And I've got a thick skin on behalf of the people of Cheltenham, not me. Um, it's a great honour to do this thing. And, you know, we can't all just sit in this chamber and agree with ourselves all the time, can we? It would be very boring, wouldn't it? So let me give you an, another way of looking at it. 
we don't want to cut any frontline services. We would not be reducing the hours of the Swindon Road Recycling Centre. And I hope that it might be possible at some point, when we've got some practical experience of how the new changes have worked, to revisit it and be, have an honest appraisal of whether it's working or not. Let's see. Um, so we've, we're here to ask questions. We've not put anything in here about cutting any frontline services, only cutting things to do with politics, basically. Cabinet, election cycles. You know, we're, it's a fairly modest proposal. I've got no problem with doing it, it further advanced, if you like. Comparing the county council, I wasn't going to mention it, but they, they do have a, a much more, I think, sophisticated way of dealing with things over there. In fact, at the county council meeting last Wednesday, we accepted all the amendments tabled by the three main political groups, Liberal Democrat, Labour and Green. They have been discussed before. Now. I don't think if we brought this to you two or three days ago, however, it would necessarily have changed the decision you just made. So um, I'm not sure it would dramatically change things, but we are here to ask questions. Now, there are things in the budget we would support, and as I said earlier, we absolutely see the work that's gone into this at a very difficult and challenging time. I do welcome the inclusion of the, uh, the fund for the coronation. I think that's something we can all agree on, and I'll probably say I'm grateful to you for accepting that idea. But what I would say is um, that we, the Conservative group, reluctantly will abstain on this uh, budget when it comes to a substantive vote, but there are things in it that we would support, but equally... We, this is a democracy, we're capable of independent thought, and there are things that we with the administration, we will be doing differently. <coughs> Councillor Wheeler, then Councillor Flynn. Yes, thank you. Um, I wasn't intended to say anything, but it just dawned on me um, when I first joined the council in 22, we had all up elections similar to next year. And uh, there was quite a large increase to the Liberal Democrat group. And there were a lot of criticisms from opposition members <laughs> about the fact that um, there were now wards, and I think the ward of Hester's Way, myself and Councillor Flynn, were both, no, sorry, it was Councillor Flynn and Councillor um, uh, Lydia Bishop, and likewise in Springbank, myself and uh, Councillor Morris, though he was a county councillor, but there was the criticism that the council was now full of new councillors and it, there wasn't the continuity. Now, all of a sudden, where this party is the larger group, we want to change it to a system that was, at that time, considered doesn't work because we've got wards where you have two new councillors. So can't have it both ways. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm minded to support the Conservative group amendments. This council doesn't need nine cabinet members. Nine cabinet members receiving an annual allowance of £15,000 each. 10% of which they are obliged to pay to the Cheltenham Liberal, Liberal Democrat Party for the purposes of campaigning. That's £14,000 going from Cabinet allowances to the local party for campaigning. That's a bit obscene. The climate is meant to be embodied in everything we do. A separate Cabinet member isn't necessary. It should feature in every portfolio. I remember a time when councillors shared portfolios and the allowance if they didn't feel able to take a whole portfolio, and that should still happen. Um, on the subject of the, the recycling centre, we should revert back to the opening hours. Um, I've already seen more fly tipping around the town, and when I've been to try and drop off um, Tetra Packs at Sainsbury's Bringbank, there's just been mountains of them everywhere. Um, Normally, I would do it on my way um, to, to a meeting or, or to a friend's house, and I, I can't do that now anymore. Uh, I was there the other day at, um, at quarter to four, dropped off some stuff, and as I was coming out of the recycling centre, it was not even quite ten to four, and the barriers were down, and people were being turned away. Um, so, I mean, we, we haven't even... It's not even open till four o'clock. Um, and, and that's at a time when, when schools are emptying out, 
and it's just it does not make it easy for people to recycle it's making it harder it will lead to more fly tipping it will lead to less recycling and uh, and we, we need to get those hours back thank you thank you madam mayor um i obviously don't want to rehash the exact same arguments as everyone else had um but in terms of the two yearly elections i think can't be stated how important I genuinely think they are for democracy in the town and for councillors being able to provide the best service they can to their residents. Um, obviously, I was elected last year, and in that initial window, you have to learn, pick up and learn so many different parts of the council. Even now, you know, I'm sending text to Max, uh, Councillor Wilkinson or Councillor Lewis or something to find out exactly who I should probably ask this question to. Um, but in that initial period, working with, with Councillor Clark was incredibly important because if I didn't have a, another councillor who was already a councillor and already knew what they were doing, we would have had two people trying to serve our residents who had no experience and wouldn't actually be able to do the best job for them. So instead I had support from Councillor Clark. She could take on some of those more difficult and more challenging issues at the beginning so we can share the load properly now and work as a team. And I think that's incredibly important. But more so, and as we've discussed earlier about how important it is to allow young people to have their voices heard. By having your elections every two years, when someone turns 18, they might actually have an election then, instead of waiting until they're potentially almost 22 before they've actually got to have a say locally on who their councillors are. And encouraging more and more people, especially young people, to vote locally is incredibly important, as we know. And in terms of cabinet members, I am not on the cabinet. And I think by reducing the amount of cabinet members you have and increasing the workload that they all take on, that's less accessible for a lot of people who might want to take that on while having other jobs and other responsibilities or families or, or things like that. But also, you're taking away resources from actually getting the job done and having oversight on where the council goes. And if you keep reducing, keep cutting back from their responsibility, well, keep adding to their responsibilities but cutting back the amount of people there are, you're ne going to neglect the climate crisis or you're going to neglect Golden Valley or housing or whichever. You have to choose something because no one can take on that much. Um, so, just as, I said, as everyone else has said, I'll be voting against the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Flynn, for her comments because I know once again she's in an unprogressive alliance with the Conservative Party <laughs> um, within Cheltenham. Um, so, it's interesting to see. I also note that um, Councillor Harmon thinks he represents the people of Cheltenham. Um, last week there was an election here and we had another Lib Dem, and we have many more Lib Dems than we have Tories. So I think we represent the people of Cheltenham, not you. And um, I'm slightly surprised that you think you do. Uh, you do, however, represent the Conservative Party. Um, and the Conservative Party have been in power for 13 years. And we have crippling interest rates, we have crippling inflation, we have a massive national debt, we have a deficit. We have the poorest fifth of our population, now poorer than the poorest fifth of the populations in Central and Eastern Europe. So given you represent the Conservative Party, and given that this is the context in which we're operating, my question to Councillor Harmon would be, really, is that the best you can come up with? Thank you, I've got no other member in Councillor Hallward, sorry. I wonder if I could make a, a point of order or a point of information. I, I remain to be stand corrected under the standing orders, but um, I just want to correct the um, possible misapprehension, I think, given in Councillor Flynn's speech that public funds were being diverted to a political party. And just to clarify, there are absolutely no rules in this council that divert any public funds to a political party. What there may be are private arrangements between individual councillors and their own political party to give their own money from their income to that political party, and that applies to all political parties equally. They are private arrangements. There are no public funds being diverted to any political party. I just wanted to put that on the record. That's a very important point. Thank you. If I've got no other member indicating that they wish to speak, I think we... Oh, Councillor Fifield, did you want... Yeah. Councillor Fifield, did you want to speak now before we go to the vote? How many minutes do I have? Is it... 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to th th thank you, um, uh, Lady Mayor. I just wanted to take up a few points, particularly on the four-year election cycle. I, I always find it fascinating that, um, that this seems to be such a difficult point for us to get across to members opposite. I mean, one of the criticisms by Council Willingham is that Conservative councils across the country uh, follow similar methods or different <laughs> methods. We're trying to suggest a way of doing things in Cheltenham we think would be best for Cheltenham. And that, that's our motivation. And that criticism, by his defence of the current arrangements, is itself him taking a position, and then you could therefore uh, criticise him in the same way about Lib Dem councils <laughs> taking alternative arrangements as well. So I don't think that really stacks up. I think we heard a lot about continuity. In my view, a lot of the times that Lib Dems use the term continuity, they actually effectively mean Lib Dem administration. That's what they want, and that's fair enough. If you want to... Uh, uh, to uh, keep an arrangement because you think it suits you politically, that's fine. But I think the key point is that continuity isn't provided by your administration, it's provided by our council officers. Uh, they are the people that work extremely hard, uh, regardless of political party, regardless of administration, they're the people that keep the lights on. And um, our proposals to reduce cabinet members is to put more money in the pot to give better council services. And I think that's a really important part of what we're trying to propose with these amendments. And um, I think, uh, to be fair, a lot of the questions about oh, where the current system supports democracy are just completely unfounded is a suggestion that we should that one-year elections is more democratic. Why is it that two is the sort of sweet spot? We hear a lot about uh, you know the Lib Dems, their Cheltenham representatives, but is that consistent with parliamentary level? Is that consistent at county council county council level? Four out of ten county councillors in Cheltenham are conservative, six are lived down. So that's 40, 60%. Alex Chalk, M our MP, is a fantastic conservative member of parliament. We then have over 30 Lib Dems in the borough council, uh, council chamber. So is it, is it that these election, this election system is more representative or is it because it enshrines and, and systemizes a Lib Dem advantage at local government level? I don't know, I will ask, I'll leave that for you to answer. But our proposals are, se are, are merely to go to the general accepted form of electioneering across the country. So um, that's what we're standing for. Standardisation, a rational, rational set of proposals. Shame we won't be able to get the support today, but I look forward to, to voting for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fifield. Councillor Harlan, would you like to sum up? Thank you. Well, I think, I think we've been said it said all, really. I mean, I would just say... Um, Thank Councillor Tuck for his. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be the flag carrier of the whole Conservative Party, but I'll do my best. Um, you know, if you are elected, uh, to, whichever party, it's a great honour to do it. Um, I have been elected three times now by the people of Parkwater to represent them, and I hope to have another go next year. So we'll see what they say then. But um, I do accept the fact that you know uh, there are swings and roundabouts in politics. There always are, and there always will be. But thank goodness we can do it in this country. Others can't. But I would um, urge, I think, the Conservative group and a great support from the Green Party um, to vote for amendments that I believe would improve the budget. Thank you, Councillor Harmon. Um, Councillor Jeffries, would you like to sum up? I have nothing further to say on the amendment, Madam Mayor, but thank you. OK, so we'll go to the vote on the amendment. We're voting on the amendments. So the amendment has been lost. There were seven votes for, 25 against, with one abstention. So we'll now move on to the formal proposing of the budget. So just, just, just double check that neither of the other group leaders have got any amendments. Oh. Just double check. I don't think they have, but can we just double check that so, so PAD just, or Green haven't got any amendments? Okay. Yet. I've been asked to just double check that... Um, 
Councillor Payne or Councillor Joy uh, have not got any amendments that they want to put forward? No. Okay. Thank you. So, Councillor Jeffries, I think you are now going to formally propose the budget. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, this is uh, formally moving the recommendations for the General Fund Revenue and Capital Final Budget Proposal for 2023. I commend this report and its budget proposals to Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. We now move on to the debate. Was that what you were indicating for, Councillor Fisher? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll stand. Um, Councillor Jeffries, when introducing this, said that inflation and the bank rate were, not, were at a very high rate and very few of us could remember. I remember when it was, the bank rate was 17%. I had two children and three jobs. <laughs> and uh, it was hard work. Um, that was under a Tory administration. Um, it went down to 14%, which was a great relief. But uh, <laughs> I still had three jobs. And also, it's been said today about um, the two-year elections. We had a fixed-term parliament um, election. Who got rid of that? It could have been the Conservatives. Really, they are about as consistent as school custard. <laughs> they are lumpy, they, they contradict themselves every time, and it really, we are struggling to, to keep our services going in this country because of things that Liz trusted. Billions underwritten by the Bank of England in a matter of days. Shake your head as much as you like, it's a fact. We have devalued our currency by 10%. Funnily enough, when we go and buy stuff from abroad, um, our inflation rate is about 10% because we pay in euros, we pay in dollars for oil and things like that. This is the best budget we could do for the money. And we know that the government is talking about more cuts, zero growth, and things like that. This isn't the best budget we could have ever presented, but considering the circumstances, it's a damn good budget. Um, and I will be supporting it, obviously. But let's get real that some of the proposals made today uh, just contradict Tory policy. Thank you, Councillor Fisher. Any member? No other member? Councillor... Oh, okay. Councillor Willingham, sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wanted to just start by thanking Councillor Payne for his comments about the um, work on deprivation. Um, I think it's something that's close to our hearts on this side of the chamber as well. Um, and I know the interest he's taken in it, both in the um, working group and as chair of ONS. Um, I think the point I would make is it's been a long time in the making and it's not something we are going to turn around quickly. But I think this council, um, certainly this, uh, the, the colleagues this side, are um, going to work on that long term. I certainly hope so. Um, and I will be putting my pressure on people to do that. Um, the other point that I wanted to make um, follows up on one of the questions. Um, licensing fees are set in law. They were set by the Licensing Act 2003 Fees Regulations 2005. And there doesn't seem to be any uplift coming forward from government. So for the intervening, what, 18 years or so, we have been asked to do the same amount of licensing work the same amount of enforcement work, but the amount of money available to this council to do that has not increased. So in real terms, that's a cut. And instead of prioritising properly funding local government, 
um, the government have gone off on um, all manner of weird and wonderful um, uh, economic shenanigans that seem to have um, crashed the pound and what have you, rather than making local government work. And everybody comes and has a go at your council isn't delivering. Well, if you had strong, well-managed, properly funded local government, we would be there. We, we, need, a, we need to be properly funded to deliver the services that we are required to deliver, those statutory services, but also the, the discretionary things that we want to do because we believe they are the right thing to do and the people we represent in Cheltenham want them. Um, and the one thing that I would urge my colleagues to do across the chamber is if you have any leverage, whether it's through the local government association, the Institute of Licensing, um, possibly the ear of the Member of Parliament, get the government to uh, review these fees so that local government is properly funded. Um, I will be supporting the budget and I'm, time's up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Willingham. Any other member? Councillor Lewis. Oh, Councillor. Uh, thank you. Yes, I mean, just a, just a quick point, really. I'm, I think the thing that, that really disappoints me um, about the budget, there is, there is good stuff in there, but the, the thing that really disappoints me is the, the raise in um, cemetery fees, because charging people an extra 10% during a cost of living crisis when they've, they've lost a loved one, um, and that service is already making a huge surplus, just seems to me to be incredibly wrong. Um, thank you. Thank you. If there is no other member, um, I'm going to go over now to Councillor Lewis. Thank you, colleagues. Just as I second this motion, I was thinking to myself the other day, as I approach pensionable age on Sunday, how important it is that we reflect on how this council invests in, safe, sorry, invests in safeguarding the Cheltenham we love for future generations. This town is so important to us, and we want to be able to give it to younger people, because as somebody who had an input in the corporate plan, apparently no young people had any input into it, so I'm clearly very old. This budget does not just deliver on that promise, it goes well over and above. I'm incredibly proud to be seconding a budget that strives towards net zero Cheltenham in everything it does, across departments from housing through to finance. The, from our net zero homes to the Cheltenham Zero Partnership, this is money incredibly well spent for a Cheltenham fit for our climate future. I'm proud to be seconding a budget that is supported by a diverse investment portfolio, so we can quite literally invest in Cheltenham's future while preserving and protecting frontline services and, and non-statutory services that we go into because we know that they are needed, like No Child Left Behind, that this government, if it had its way, would have us cut to the bone. These services save lives, they improve lives, they shape the Cheltenham we live in, and I'm incredibly proud that this budget will be backing them up. And we, once again, have to bail out the government and its complete failure to adequately fund local government. I'm proud to be seconding a budget that is as generous as it possibly can be for those in need, including our council tax support scheme, which I know is coming a little bit later on, which is going to be providing support for those hardest hit by the cost of living crisis. Much of our climate work that's coming up is devoted to supporting those hardest hit by this cost of living crisis, particularly our community and voluntary sector organisations, which are the glue that hold this town together. As much as Alex Chalk may say he keeps Cheltenham rolling, he makes Cheltenham the place it is, those communities, those organisations, those people who put themselves out on the line to close the gap between what central government ought to do and what it actually does, make Cheltenham what it is. So I'd like to thank Pete, who won't thank himself for all the incredible work he's put in. He is truly incredible. I couldn't do it. Immensely proud of him. Thank you to our Section 151 officer and to the monitoring officer, who I hope will sleep soundly tonight after many days where I'm sure they didn't. And to all the officers who have been working day and night across all the departments, including my own and many others represented in this cabinet, who are delivering incredible results on an incredibly tight budget. I'd also like to thank the Conservatives for what was a really reasoned amendment. They bring it forward every time and we really enjoy having it back, but I think they stick to their guns. They've had it costed. 
a lot can be said for people who do take that time and that effort to propose an amendment, and it does take time, and I appreciate the time they put in. I really look forward to seeing how the King Charles Fund supports many of the things we're hoping for in Cheltenham, including biodiversity, because we can never have enough money for biodiversity, let me tell you. And of course, thank you to the Green Party for all the time, effort, and they they've truly have devoted themselves to supporting our ambitious climate strategy today in this meeting. They have had nothing to say about it but the kindest of words, and I really appreciate that. And their support in lieu of proposing anything themselves. So I recommend this budget to you all. Thank Pete and to all the officers. Best of luck. Thank you. Now, Councillor Jeffries to sum up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like to thank um, colleagues from across the chamber for their questions at the start, and also inputs into the debate. It's always a varied debate. Uh, Councillor thank you for seconding this budget. I really appreciate that. Um, I just want to pick up a couple of points, if I may. Um, firstly, Councillor Joy, your mention of uh, local accountability and so forth, and I agree wholeheartedly. I think this is a fundamental Liberal principle in terms of local decision-making, local democracy. But as what has been shown through the budget process, there is so much that we are not in control of. It's a behest of national government. So whilst, yes, I agree, we, we should have these decision-making powers on what affects Cheltenham, um, then you get equal representation and equal accountability. And then lastly, before I close on the, the budget itself, Councillor Payne, you mentioned deprivation. I think that's one of the reasons why I support this budget in the balanced manner that's been, been presented, because through time and again, through years, in fact, my time even before I joined this council, Liberal Democrats have always strived to try and protect and support areas of the town which are suffering deprivation and sadly we still have to do so and I thank colleagues across the council who continue to fight for those individuals in our town that suffer deprivation. <laughs> colleagues the uncertainty and volatility with our national economy in the medium term will be challenging. This budget will need continually monitoring and reviewing. The last 12 months has been an enormous amount of work and I suspect the next 12 months will be as well but we are committed and continue to focus on our town and our residents. I'd like to thank members across this chamber because there are a variety of forums where members have been engaged with the budget. Finally, thanks to my cabinet colleagues and the leader. The budget is not created in isolation. Their challenge, input and collective support have been invaluable. I move the budget, Madam Mayor. So that has been carried, 26 for and 7 abstentions. Thank you. We will now move on to agenda item 12, which is the council tax resolution. And Councillor Jeffries, the floor is yours once again. Not quite finished yet, Madam Member, we're getting there. Uh, the purpose of this report is to enable the Council to set the Council tax for 2023-2024. As we just agreed the budget, which included of our level of the Council tax, this report also includes this and the Council tax requirements of the precepting organisations, Gloucestershire County Council and the Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire. Both have met and set their Council tax levels for 2023-2024. I formally move the Council tax resolution and the report before you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. No questions. So we'll move straight to the debate then. Um, any member wish to speak? Three minutes maximum? No? Okay. Um, Councillor Jeffries, do you have anything further that you wish to add? No? So we will move direct. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you were shaking your head, so I thought you said no. <laughs> oh, go on, you know you want to. <laughs> No 
No? Okay, so we'll move straight to the vote then. And that was unanimous. Thank you. Agenda item 13, Council Tax Support Funds. Councillor Jeffries, would you like to introduce this report? I think I will, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Members, this is a new one-off Council Tax Support Fund. On the 19th of December last year, the Government announced a Council Tax Support Fund for councils to support vulnerable households with the Council Tax Bills during 2023-2024. And the funding from government has been allocated on the council tax support caseload. We've been allocated £173,493, based on the total caseload of about 6,500. Now, the government expects the majority of the funding is used to award up to £25, depending on the balance due to be paid to all council tax recipients at the start of the financial year. The remainder is effectively a discretionary uh, allocation to support council tax claimants and those that are economically vulnerable. Now, most authorities don't award 100% council tax would have to give up to £25 sorry, to all of their caseload, um, and even a small balance for discretionary awards. Now we do in Cheltenham, and I'm really pleased, and I've said this before, that we do give 100% uh, relief to some of our residents. So we'll be making the award to only a portion of our caseload. We can therefore increase that £25 amount. We currently have about two and a half, just shy of 2,500 cases with a balance to pay after council tax support. So I'm proposing, and through this report, to allocate £60 to each of those cases. Uh, that would use approximately £147,000 and leave us with about £27,000 to award to new council tax support claimants and other economically vulnerable council tax payers. This one-off fund will in, if, will in effect operate as an additional hardship policy. This is attached to Appendix 3, colleagues. Providing support for our most financially vulnerable residents is something this council continues to focus on. And given the continuing volatile, volatile economic turbulence, this additional funding added to this council's existing council tax support scheme will mean more support in these troubling financial times. I'd like to put on record my thanks to all the officers in the Revenue Benefits team for what continues to be an extraordinary amount of work processing these applications and supporting our residents in our town. I commend the report to you for the local tank, council tax support fund. fund. Thank you. Remember? Just quickly, Madam Mayor, I think it's important that you remember that we're voting through or we voted through a council tax increase which in a council tax D household, including the county council and police and parishes, could see some council tax going up by nearly £100 a year. Um, and that's not an insignificant amount of money for many people in our town. We've already heard that areas in St Mark's and Hester's Way and other parts of the town are amongst the most deprived areas uh, in the town and in the country. Um, so the tax increase, whilst modest, uh, is nevertheless still another burden to local residents. And, and, and down essentially to a lack of government funding for social care, because the vast majority of this increase uh, is due to the county council increase on social care, um, not to mention the police as well. So we just need to bear that in mind. Not everyone can afford this. It is tough. And that's why, as Councillor Jeffries just said, the fact that um, we can give full council tax support to about 2,500 extremely poor and vulnerable people in our town is really important. And most councils don't do that. So well done. Yeah. Thank you. Nobody else? No? Oh, okay. Um, did you want to respond to that, Councillor Jeffries? No? Okay. We'll move on to the debate. Any member? No? So, over to you, um, Councillor Jeffries. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think um, Councillor Baker um, hit the nail on the head. We don't have to have a council tax support scheme where we allocate 100% relief to some of our residents. It's a discretionary scheme. But actually, it's a blooming vital one for those that are suffering financially. And the fact that we now have this, with this additional funding, means we get to support more financially vulnerable residents. So I'm really pleased and really pleased that I bring this report before Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Right, when I move to the, to the vote on the recommendations. And that's unanimous, thank you. So moving on to agenda item 14, which is the council order of precedence and nominations for mayor-elect and deputy mayor-elect. Um, I'd like to invite the chief executive, Gareth Edmondson, to introduce the report. Members should note the updated order of precedence, which is on nod.gov as a supplement. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, very, very short introduction. This is a, a paper that will be familiar to many of you. It's just about confirming the uh, order of precedence only, uh, and that there is the appendix. Uh, this has been recently updated um, uh, to reflect uh, uh, having a, a, new, a new member of the chamber. Um, so I will, I will stop there, but hopefully the, the report itself is fairly self-explanatory. Is that a question, Councillor McCloskey? Um, there is a more up-to-date version than the one that's on Mod Duck, I think. <laughs> yes, it's there in black and white on the on the laptop. <laughs> we have changed that, but it's there still on the papers. <laughs> uh, just to come back. Councillor McCloskey, uh, there were a couple of small amendments that were made, and there's an updated version of the uh, of the appendix. Any other member wishing to ask a question? No. Oh, Councillor Pinnegar. Uh, just a very simple one. Um, I don't know what uh, the ballot column represents. The letters. Could somebody explain? Uh, when we get a lot of new members at the same time, we have to then have a ballot for the order so that it sort of comes out. And you put names in a hat, basically, and draw it out so you then get a, an order from it. If there's no further questions, we'll move on to the debate. Any member? Very quiet now. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Right, OK. So we'll now um, move on and ask the Chief Executive if he's got anything further to add before we vote. Nothing further to add, thank you, Madam Mayor. OK, so we'll now vote on the recommendations. We'll now uh, move on to agenda item 15, which is the council diary and the report of the deputy leader, Councillor Jeffries. You've not heard much from me this afternoon, Madam Mayor, um, but I thought I'd round, round today's proceedings off with, in the leader's absence, I have the pleasure of introducing the report of the proposed council diary for September 2023 to August 2024. Colleagues will be aware that there's a huge number of meetings that this council undertakes. Um, the diary formulation follows the same sort of process as previous years, and I am aware that this process has and continues to respond to the needs of members. Probably not perfect, but it's uh, the process we've got. It is an evolutionary process. 
It aims to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, many thanks to the officers in the DS Democratic Services Unit for their continued work in to being as accommodating to members wherever possible. Uh, just one thing to note, uh, colleagues, in the executive summary, it uh, mentions the Executive Director for Finance, Assets and Regeneration is proposing that we move the February budget meeting, i.e. this one, um, from a Monday afternoon to a Friday afternoon. Apparently, the County Council have consulted on all districts, given they are looking to possibly changing their meeting in February. This change will allow our Council to meet after the County Council has concluded its budget pro setting process. In terms of sequencing, this makes logical sense. Um, on this note, I commend the report to Council. Madam Mayor, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any natural spaces in October which would take account of the political parties' annual conferences. Has that been taken into consideration? I mean, if it has, then I, I'm not seeing it, but um, uh, I'll, I'll wait uh, confirmation from one way or the other. I can respond that the, the Democratic Services team do take account of whenever they know that when the political party season is, if you may say, but they do take account of what they know. Any other member wishing to ask a question? No? We'll move on to the debate. Any member? No? Okay, we'll move on then to uh, Councillor Jeffries, the Deputy Leader. Is there anything you wish to add? Nothing further, Madam Mayor. And we'll move to the vote. That's carried unanimously. Agenda item 16, notices of motion. We have none. Agenda item 17, um, any other item that I determine is urgent and which requires a decision. Again, I have nothing to report. <laughs> Agenda item 18, the Local Government Act 1972 exempt information. This council is recommended to approve the following resolution that in accordance with section 100A bracket 4, close bracket, Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting for the remaining agenda items as it is likely that in view of the nature of the business to be transacted or the nature of the proceedings, if members of the public are present, there will be disclosed to them exempt information as defined in paragraph 3, part 1, Schedule 12A, Local Government Act 1972. Namely, paragraph 3, information relating to the financial business affairs of any particular person, including the authority holding that information. Can everybody uh, raise their hands if they're in agreement with that? <clears throat> 